So the first thing I want to tell you is I, I want to thank our supporters because without supporters, we really could not do this. And I've been working with our supporters for the last year to get their support and their feedback and their, I, their thoughts on how, what's the best way to do this. And so I really want to thank them, not only for supporting the conference, but for supporting me in actually doing that job because I'm not a person that's a marketing person, I'm actually a computer scientist. And it's a real jump to move to that. Secondly, everyone, you've been given an evaluation form in addition to doing supporters and sharing this session. I'm also um, working with the evaluations committee. I want to see the evaluation forms turned in to the reception desk. They should be in your bag. You can also get one at the reception desk. So when you turn it in, you get an extra surprise. <laughs> so <laughs> anyone that turns it in, please do that. So the real job that I have right now is to uh, introduce our keynote speaker, which is really an amazing task for me because I've never introduced a keynote speaker before. And I get to introduce a very amazing woman that has also been very helpful in, in for me to actually um, become a better person and do better, <laughs> do better. Uh, <laughs> she's looking at me like, oh no, <laughs> no. It actually be a better volunteer for ACM. So I really appreciate your help. So Linda Hardman, um, who's up on our screen right now, is actually on the management team for Centrum Viscunda and Informatica, CWI at Utrecht University or University. Um, she's a professor of multimedia discourse interaction and um, which is really amazing. But what's really the most amazing to me, I mean, she's really amazing, but she's also can, uh, has received the award of distinguished scientist from ACM. And she is, in addition, the president of Informatics Europe. So she's really doing a lot, all volunteer work, in addition to her wonderful studies. She graduated from Glasgow University um, and she has, she's married and has two children. Um, Linda, please come and. <laughs> yeah, How's this sound check on the mic? Is that okay? So my talk's not gonna be as good as that, I can tell you. Okay, good morning. So many of you have, you all have already given uh, talks at conferences, and those who haven't yet probably will. Um, and the great thing about giving a talk at a conference is that they normally give you 15 or 20 minutes to explain your work that took you six months or a year or two years to do in 15 minutes. And you're just telling a story. That's basically what's going on. You have an audience and you have to entertain them for 15 minutes. You have to persuade them that your work is sufficiently interesting to actually go away and read the papers and see what you really did. And the question is, how do you put that story together? So that's what I'm doing today. I'm taking N years of research and trying to pump it into 45 minutes because I'm a keynote today, which is extremely pleasant. Um, and also keep you awake. That's also one of the things I have to do. And what I'm really passionate about is how I can get computers to tell stories. So how can we get computers to deliver content to us in a way that we appreciate and is useful and actually tells us things perhaps we didn't know before. Now, I don't think that's actually going to happen in my lifetime. Um, but I do think there are things we can do with computers to help us get 
uh, towards that state of the art. And this is where I'm going to know our next speaker. Uh, this is a Google search <laughs> on videos. I use Google search all the time. It's a great, great tool. But in terms of my story today, when you're looking for videos, um, what you get when you do a search is a list of relevant videos. Um, and that's sort of cool. So you get an idea of what's out there and what you should look at. But if you actually have to go through every single one of these videos and uh, look at it and see what they're saying and see what all the images are, you could be spending hours just trying to go through all this information to get what you really want to know. So my dream is, how can we find um, a way of generating the video that is just perfect for you? So the video contains the information that you want, it contains it in the way that you want to have it. Is it image, is it text, is it sound? And here I just want to show you a video that has been generated uh, in response to what do you think of the war as a solution in Afghanistan. Okay, so we'll, we'll get back to that clip later in the talk. But this is an example of what I would like to be able to do. So the question is, how do we get from these lists, these relevant media items, videos, images, and how do we then get to creating a story? Um, so from my perspective, there are three things you need. Uh, there's the content on the web. Uh, I didn't know how to represent content, so we have some physical pieces of paper, but every piece of paper is meant to represent hundreds of thousands of videos and images. It's a big heap. There's things we know about it, some things we don't know about it. We have a whole bunch of descriptions, uh, which again, I'll explain a little bit later. And then we have the glue. And for the last two months, I've been going around trying to find the visual representation for glue for my story. And I eventually decided to come up with this symbol, which some of you may recognize as a Chinese character, and others of you, like myself, will find it an aesthetically pleasing collection of lines. And this is my glue. It's the Chinese symbol for story or narrative. And if anyone does speak the language afterwards, please tell me if it has any close concept to what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's the symbol that will come back in the talk to represent this glue. How do you stick these pieces of images and videos together to get your story? So here we have the content. Um, it's all out there. It's almost all out there. Okay, people still make pictures and they still make videos and they're still adding it to the heap. So the heap is just getting larger. And the more stuff that goes in there, the harder it is to get the stuff out that you really want to have. Um, and some of the things you want to know about are in this content. So we, we think in terms of concepts, so we want to depict those concepts. For example, oh, let me take a random concept, woman. Um, so here we have content depicting a woman. Some of these women you may recognize, some of these women you should recognize, uh, others you may not. Um, we have some Irish people in the audience, the first female professor in Ireland, uh, Mary Ryan, I believe, another amazing woman. Um, and these are all very different images. There's a, a drawn image, there's a painted image, uh, photographs. 
But the concept, woman, is the same. So how do we denote what the concept is? And this is where the linked open data cloud, these sets of descriptions help us with that. So here we have one concept, woman, and I'm now giving it a name. So this is a URL, and if you have your computer open, you, you can type in that URL, and it will take you to a web page where you start getting lots of descriptions of women that are readable both by human and by the computer. And it's being readable by the computer that's the interesting thing. So we can denote this concept woman and it's unique, and we can uh, use that for whatever purposes. So we had many different images um, for this single concept woman. On the other hand, if you take any specific image, we can have lots of different concepts that relate to it. So it might relate to the whole head. So here if it's, it's a woman and we have the head of the woman in, that, in the frame, so it could relate to the whole image. On the other hand, there are other concepts like, I know, nose, ear, mouth, glasses, red hair. And these are concepts that relate to the part of the image. And then there's a whole set of uh, literature um, that if you like my story, you can go away and read about how we relate these different concepts to the different parts of an image or text or say a video. In the video, when you, you want to have say, a object that's moving through the video, you want to have the concept related to the whole depiction of that object throughout the video. So we've now labeled our concepts. So this is useful for what we're going to do next in creating our presentation. So this is the linked open data diagram. Just to give you an idea, how many have seen this before? OK, very good. That's, it's getting there. Okay, in a few years' time, everyone will have seen it. So bear with me then while I explain this to those who haven't seen it yet. Um, this is a collection of linked concepts, the linked open data uh, diagram. And it looks fairly large, but in fact, each one of these blobs is in its own right um, a collection of concepts. So Wikipedia, I presume most of you are familiar with Wikipedia. Wikipedia has a back end that's uh, readable by the computer in terms of concepts called DBpedia. So it scrapes uh, some of the box content on Wikipedia and uh, puts it into a machine readable format. So DBpedia itself in the English version contains something like four and a half million entries. <coughs> so if you project that out to the whole diagram, we're talking billions of uh, concepts and links amongst these concepts. So this is a huge resource. We didn't have the resource 10 years ago, but we have it now, which is a really great thing to have. So when we start looking at um, what this lady was saying in these interviews, we want to know which were the concepts that she was actually speaking about. So in this case, um, there was the concept of bomb. Um, actually, maybe she didn't mention that. Her colleague mentioned that. Uh, so this is your DBP, DBPD entry on BOM. And again, you have, in this case, an English explanation. But the point about these uh, entries on these concepts is that the concepts are described in different languages. So it's not exactly language independent, but it's multi-language, which means you can then start using these links across different languages. And here we have a different concept. Uh, the war in Afghanistan. And then the question is, and there are now tools available to, to do this, how does the concept of bomb link to the concept of Afghanistan? So this is um, a, a, a screenshot from a visual data web where they have this uh, algorithm which allows you to take two concepts and find the shorter paths between these. And in some sense, any two concepts in the linked open data cloud are related to each other anyway, because they're either one link away, because they're close to each other, or there's some huge number of links away. And in this case, we're about three or four links away. And the thing that doesn't work in the linked open data cloud is that you don't know what are the meaningful paths for humans. 
And that's the bit that I'm interested in in my research. If you have these links amongst concepts, which are the interesting ones? Which are the useful ones? Not which ones are relevant. In some sense, relevant is, a, is, is something you can count, right? Is it informationally close to the information that you want? But what is, I don't know, my next door neighbor's uh, cat likes jellyfish. Yeah, okay, that it could be relevant to the neighbors, but it's not that interesting. So what is this magic interesting? So this is where we start getting to my glue that I didn't know how to describe. And in order to put together that video sequence, as I showed at the beginning, um, you need to have knowledge of how we as humans communicate. And there are plenty of sources of how we communicate. Um, so narrative in stories, we can model the narrative in stories. Um, you could also have semiotics, so how do we interpret images? Um, are they more real life images? Are they more um, symbolic meanings in Im images? So these are all potential ones as well, but today I'm just going to stick to uh, Aristotle's art of rhetoric and film theory. Just to give you a feel for, okay, when I say I want glue, what types of glue things do I want? So basically uh, 400, BC, I believe. Yes, 400 BC, so that, that was a while ago. Um, Aristotle came up with the uh, art of rhetoric and he identified three different concepts, the logos, the ethos, and the pathos. Um, and the logos is uh, what we associate in our culture with the left brain and it's really things like uh, logical argumentation. So I hope my story today does have a lot of logic in it, <laughs> even though I'm waving my hands and telling stories. Uh, there's argument from reason, and we use data. So if you like the scientific method, it's correct. You have evidence. You base your conclusions on the evidence that you have. Uh, as a small anecdote, um, I, again, I was looking for an image to illustrate logos. And uh, my daughter says, oh, you should use a brain and a head because that's really cool and everyone knows what that means, uh, rationality and things like that. And I looked for images of brains and heads and logos and they were all male contours of heads. So I specifically looked for female contours of heads with a brain in it to illustrate logos and I couldn't find them. So I give you a challenge for the next couple of days. Can you find it? <laughs> on, on, you're not allowed to make it, right? You have to find it on the web. Anyway, that was the anecdote. Um, ethos. Ethos is all about the speaker. So today you're listening to me with bated breath because Bev said these amazing things about me. Um, if Beth had come in and said, oh, we couldn't find any speakers, they were all busy, but we had Linda. <laughs> and she was willing to do it cheap. Then you'd be listening less attentively to what I was saying. So this ethos is how do you relate to the speaker? And I'm guessing that if you heard one or other of these people, you'd be more or less likely to believe what they were saying. Oh, absolutely, yes, yes, yes. So it's, it's your emotional bond to either image. If, if, I, if I tell you that they said something, whether it was true or not, you would associate more or less truth to what they were saying based on your emotional attachment to the <coughs> images. And then we have pathos. And you're all meant to go, ah. <laughs> that was fun looking for that image. Um, so pathos is how you stir up your audience. Rain is brilliant at that. Every time Rain speaks, I go, oh, I have to help women empowerment. I have to, I have to. Um, I'm not very good at it. I don't stir people up. I write things down. My, my pen is my sword, or my type, my keyboard is my sword. Um, so anyway, so this is the, uh, the Aristotle logos ethos pathos. So these are things we need to encode with our content to allow us to use it to create stories with a computer. And then we have film theory. And has anyone heard of the Kuleshov effect? Am I talking to you? Oh good, this is exciting. Um, okay, there's a little te technical difficulties here that I won't bore you with, but It's silent, so don't confuse the real sound.
Okay, right. So what you saw there were three separate scenes with some food and then uh, a girl who has been laid out in a coffin and then a lady lying on a couch. And what the, this person Kuleshov um, noted was that this, this actor's face in between is ascribed emotions depending on what has been placed before in the film fragment. So after the soup, he's perceived by the participants as being hungry. And after the, uh, the girl in the coffin being sad, and after the, uh, the woman on the couch as being interested. <laughs> and this is a neutral face in three cases. And this is something we have to be very aware of, that we perceive different things depending on the visual context that's going on. And this is from like 1900 or something, around that time. So this was, this was perceived very early on in the film industry. Before that, it had been theater, right? So in theater, actors were just acting the whole time, but you could use the same shots for getting these different effects. So it's something we have to be aware of when you're starting to put pieces together in a film sequence automatically. And then we have this. And again, what you see are different shots. And, and, and it's difficult because we've been watching films since you know, we've been this high, um, and we just do this naturally. But there are film shots, and one shows a woman, and another shows a guy, and another shows a cliff, and another shows a falling object. And we make the story ourselves. The story is what we produce internally, that she's frightened, she's being chased, he chases her off the cliff, and she falls to her death. But that's not what's in the film. The film is just the shots of these different objects doing different things. And that's why I'm interested in generating sequences of video, because I don't have to say everything explicitly. If I'm trying to generate text, natural language text, it's really difficult because you have to get the grammar correct and the, the sentence structure correct and the, the, whole, the whole thing. In some senses, you have to fill all, all, the, all the detail and, and dot the I's and cross the T's. And video you can get away with a bit more. You can, you've got these, these flexible bits around the edges. So these examples are my glue uh, that we can use in order to um, combine video fragments to create a story out of different fragments. So, so far now, um, we have the content. We agree there's a ton of content out there. Um, I've explained the links on the data cloud. So there's all these descriptions. These descriptions are linked together. We can use these links in different ways. And then we can use our knowledge of how we communicate as humans and use that to create videos. So we're done. But there's a problem. So how do we, um, how do we make sure that we can actually go towards the, uh, the video clip that we want? Um, right, so how do we make sure that these results together are going to address the needs of the user? Again, this is, my, this is my big question. How do we get to where we want to be from where we are now? So where are we now? Um, Vox Populi is an example system that was built a few years ago that really generates video sequences. That's where you saw the sequence from the beginning. And uh, there was a whole system that, that worked. And we had the whole thing running end to end. So I will show you that. I'll go to that in great detail. And then we have the environmental uh, issue example where um, we, we had the experiences from Vox Populi. And then we wanted to know, OK, if we want to do a different um, discourse structure, different storyline, then what type of information we need to do something different. So I'll explain that, first of all, the whole system Vox Populi, and then the annotations we're looking at for um, the environmental decision making. So first of all, Vox Populi. So this was work done with uh, my PhD student, Stefano Bocconi, a number of years ago, together with Frank Nash. And this thesis was basically generating um, video documentaries from annotated media repositories. 
And this was pre-linked open data collect, so you had to do a lot of annotations yourself. If you like my story today, I did bring his PhD thesis, if you want to click through. It's also available online. And what he did, he basically uh, collected a lot of video material. And the reason they collected this video material was actually after the 9-11, just 15 years ago, when he and some friends wanted to understand what the American people thought about um, the implications of the event for potential war in Afghanistan. And they went to these different places in the United States and they had a bunch of questions that they asked uh, different people on the street. And at that point, he hadn't decided what his PhD was going to be about. And when he came back, we were saying, do your PhD about all the video that you took? He's going, no, 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 no. So it took us about 18 months to persuade him he really wanted to use this video material to do his PhD on, which he did, which is great. The reason they went to the United States is that um, his friends made documentaries. And discussing amongst themselves, they realized that when you make a documentary, you have the story from the director. So the director decides exactly, or I should say the editor decides exactly which pieces are going to come into this documentary. And you have one single story. But they'd, they'd created a lot of uh, material, and all the material they can make it available online. So why couldn't they just have the material and allow it to be explored by users? So this is where Stefano was interested in, okay, how do we make this material more available and create these different stories depending on what users are interested in hearing about. So I showed you the completed video at the beginning, but let's just show you um, the single video that was taken in answer to a single question. Okay, yes. Okay, so that gives you an idea of the, the, uh, the complete answer to the question. Because when I showed you the clip earlier, you could see she was appearing at different stages in the video. I'll get back to that. Okay, so when we're generating the short story uh, in response to what do you think of the war in Afghanistan, then this shows you the, um, if you like, the structure of the sequence that we generated. So first of all, the lady on the left says, I'm not a fan of military action. So she's actually not liking the fact there's military action. Um, and the second guy is saying, war's never sold anything. So he's against war. Um, and then the lady says, but I cannot think of a more effective solution. So she's not exactly contradicting herself, um, but she is making two statements that don't necessarily agree with each other. And then the gentleman at the end, he, he thinks it's all a load of nonsense because he's saying all this money is spent on bombs that hit nothing of value. So if we're going to generate this sequence, then how are we going to get through the different steps to get the information needed to do this generation? So we talked about uh, Aristotle and uh, film theory. So in this case, we have some rhetorical annotations. Um, so this is the logos that we're doing. Um, this is mostly verbal. Uh, some visual can be possible, but it's difficult in this case to have logic uh, illustrating the image. And we use the argumentation model of Toulmin, which I'll explain in a couple of slides. And in terms of the descriptive uh, information, so what was the question asked? So it's useful to know when someone responds, which question they're responding to in terms of topics. Um, we're also interested in the interviewee. So I showed with the ethos images earlier, um, whether you like it or not, we tend to believe people from our own um, uh, culture, uh, skin color, educational level, uh, even um, uh, financial means. We tend to 
feel part of that group and we tend to believe them more than others. So this interviewee, where they come from, is also important. If you want to persuade a certain audience, then you want to have people that look like that particular audience. And there's also the filmic uh, information themselves. So we have a particular continuity. So I don't know if you noticed with that sequence right at the beginning, that most of the shots were in daylight, and then right at the end, there was a, a woman speaking at nighttime. And every time I see that, it's like, oh, this is, there's something wrong. Oh, right, she's just speaking at night. So it's not wrong or anything, but it's, it's just breaking the expected continuity of the shots we've had beforehand. And so in terms of panning and shaping, um, most films you see, there's an editor that's done this montage correctly, so we don't notice what's going on. But when you're automatically generating, if you suddenly have a close-up of a head and then a distant shot of a whole body and then a medium shot all mixed in with each other of the same person, it, it feels a bit strange. So you have to make sure you're doing this right. And the gaze direction of the speaker, that can be used uh, if you've got two different lines of an argument and you have person one looking this way and person two looking that way with opposing views, then you can put all the people the same opposing views here all looking the same way and that contributes to getting across that this is view one and this is view two. And I'm not making this up, right? This is what they all teach in film school. Um, lighting conditions, background sound, it's all different things that matter. So here we've got the, the pathos is very much, um, if you've got a distant shot, you're unlikely to have any emotional bond with the speaker, whereas if it's a close-up, then there'll be some emotional bond. I, I don't mean the ethos, I don't mean, you know, do you believe this person, but the, you know, the, the cuddle factor of the, the speaker. And with background sound, you can put in some slimy music or some exciting music, and then again, you, you increase the emotions and the, uh, the tension from the, the viewer. So then how did uh, Stefano put together this system for generating these videos? Basically by finding some representation of the content of the sentences that are being spoken by the users that he could then manipulate that on a larger scale. And in knowledge representation, you can either take a very complex, intricate way of representing something which does exactly what you want but it takes three days to do anything to generate a sequence, or you take an insufficient representation which is very fast and you don't really um, get the amount of knowledge representation you need. And he came up with, if you like, the middle of the road solution, a uh, three-part statement, which allowed to him to talk about uh, war, so that's the, the topic, the, the noun, if you like, of, of what's being mentioned in the video and whether this is a, a good solution or a bad solution or not the solution. And through these statements, he could then describe the different, um, uh, the different concepts that are being used by the speaker. So in this particular case, the, the clip from the woman is war is opposite diplomacy. So that would be the description he used for one of the statements that she made. And these are just the different types of relationships there. And these days, uh, the whole land, landscape of uh, concept encapsulation is very different. We have standards on the internet now, WordNet and uh, SCOS and things like that. So these are things that Stefano had to build himself, but nowadays you don't have to build it yourself anymore. And then what we do is we connect the statements together so that uh, if war is the best solution, this is opposite, diploma is the best solution because diplomacy as a concept is opposite of war. And war best solution is also the opposite of war not solution. And in that way, you get a graph of statements. And then what he did was he basically, he took these statements, he took the vocabulary that he had, and in his case, the vocabulary was fairly small, say 150 terms, and he would generate until he'd run out of all new statements that could be generated, and he had a huge graph. So you can imagine now a graph of all these statements connected with each other. And then he looked to see in his database which videos he had that corresponded to the graph, and he chucked out all the nodes that had no video that corresponded to it. I don't, you don't have to get that, but if you, if you follow what I'm saying, then you get the idea of how he's doing this, this graph generation. Okay, so then we have this graph of related statements. 
And the question is next, how do we then start getting a linear ordering of these uh, video pieces so we can play our sequence of video? And uh, there he found the Toulmin model for argumentation. So again, he didn't make it up. He found it in the, in the literature. And it was a convenient, fairly small model that allowed him to take the elements of the model and annotate the different statements in terms of that. And the most interesting thing to point out here is that if you have the claim at the top and the concession down the middle, that the claim is the main statement the person is making. So this is what they mean. Um, you know, war is a solution. But the concession, and in this case, um, the lady was saying, I cannot think of a more effective solution. Sorry, sorry, the concession was, I'm not a fan of military action. I'm getting it all wrong now. I'm not a fan of military action is the concession. But that's not really what her statement is. So if Stefano were to encode on that piece of the video um, with a statement, um, military action not effective, then he'd be misrepresenting what she really meant, which is why you need to encode the concession. So she says, military action not effective, but it's a concession to her main claim that there is no more effective solution. So this is why Tolman is uh, important, that you can encode the intention of the speaker and not just the words that they're saying. So this is part of my glue again. Um, so this is when you then generate the sequence, which I won't play to you again, because you've seen it already, but you get the idea. So this is then the sequence that was generated based on all those different types of information put in the system and then making a linear graph based on the theory. Okay, so uh, if you're interested in more of Vox Populi, there's more available at this URL. The slides will be made available, so you don't have to rush and copy it down right now, but it might take a day or two before the slides are available, but they will be available. Okay, so that's uh, the Vox Populi system. That's a system that really works. Worked, actually, it really worked. Um, software has this way of organically disintegrating, unfortunately. Um, but we do, we do have all the knowledge from that particular project. So the next question for me certainly is, okay, that was one particular way of uh, encoding <coughs> how we uh, communicate with each other, so the Tolman model, and how we can combine that with a generation process, taking various factors into account. And then my next question was, okay, so if we want to have a different topic, then which sort of annotations do we need for that? So in Stefano's case, it was, a, it was the first time, okay, let's try this and how does it work? And this time is, oh, we knew how it worked and now we want to look at the annotations. So this was a project with a student from the University of Amsterdam and um, she was really interested in, in helping people like ourselves to come up with ways of understanding complex environmental issues so you could then make a decision. So you know, as a voter, um, do you want to vote for a, a fracking plant in your vicinity because it's good for the economy or do you want to vote against it because it's going to ruin the environment? So how do you make these decisions? And you know, that was her motivation and then working together it was, well, how are we going to come up with this glue, this discourse structure for what we want to do with the information? So, um, I guess, yeah, the, uh, I've said all this. The goal was to specify the information that should be captured in the annotations. And what she did was that she went and asked some experts. So experts from the environmental governments, um, experts in the broadcasting industry, from journalism, from video production. And then she put together all the information gathered from the interviews and came up with potential ways of annotating the video media. And then after she'd done that, she then went and did a survey to ask, again, people such as ourselves, the viewers, about the types of information they would like to have. So, I mean, this is based on our current culture anyway, where people make documentaries and we watch them. So the documentary makers are used to putting certain information in the documentary and we as viewers 
are uh, used to getting uh, specific information from our documentaries, so that she still wanted to check to see how people viewed it. Um, so I won't go through all these uh, items individually, but just to give you an, a feel for the types of descriptions that are going on. Um, so what is the particular issue? And in this case, it was uh, shale gas drilling. What might be the impact? So what are the consequences, either positive or negative, of what's going on? Uh, what is the timing of this impact? Are we talking short-term financial gains versus long-term destruction of the environment? Uh, what are the personal implications? So are my neighbors going to lose the value on their house? And what type of people are involved? So experts on different sides of the problem. Um, also different arguments. So how are the arguments structured? So you can do persuasion um, that one can, so we're taking the experts, right? So the experts, are how are they going to explain the different issues to their audience? And um, which types of actors are you going to put in your film? So are you going to get the boss of Shell to say that uh, fracking is an excellent idea and everyone's not going to believe him because they have this financial involvement? And are they going to get some, some sort of public opinion for that? And then we have also details on the scene. So <coughs> where is this film being made? Is, it, is, the, is the position of the filming actually going to influence the opinion of the viewer that's watching it? So this just gives you a sort of idea of all the different things you could use as annotations. I mean, if you look at both these lists together, that's a lot of annotations being required here. Um, and then, um, uh, Karina then went to her survey to ask, again, people like us who uh, were having to make a decision. So you give them a scenario, you know, what would you think about this particular issue? And um, she came up with all these different um, text answers. And from all the different text answers, she generated this word cloud. And then I guess the thing to see here is that People want, want to understand the benefits, the risks, and the facts. Health, opinion. So we sort of see the words jumping out, but there are issues that, again, people like you and me are interested in. So based on the, the experts' um, understanding of what you want to put in the documentary, based on the survey results, what people wanted, <coughs> we get this shorter list of things that are most important to the viewers. So that gives us, as the computer scientists, an idea where we should we start doing the annotations. We don't have to annotate everything, but where can we start with the annotations? And that allowed us to stripe out some of the um, concepts that <coughs> one would like to have, but aren't necessary to have. So now we're reducing our list of annotations. So it's not, again, you don't have to read it all, but you can just see that there's a lot less uh, black words there. <coughs> and here there are fewer words as well. And then what you'd want to do, you'd want to generate the video. Well, I need to find the funding for that, so we haven't done that yet. Uh, and we want to build a system. So this is something uh, with my students at Utrecht, I can hopefully start on doing the next step with that. <coughs> so this is just to show you that understanding what the glue is is not always easy. Um, and it takes time to understand you know, what your viewers are going to want and how you can actually do that. Some of the good news is that many of these annotations can actually be done automatically. So um, language analysis, uh, visual analysis is all such a state of the art now. There's all sorts of things you can put in. Uh, you can do facial rec recognition across all sorts of um, uh, different data sets. And if any of you are looking for a film to watch, then I will plug uh, Eye in the Sky, which gives a wonderful scenario of how we use all the current computer science technologies in terms of facial recognition to uh, work in a, a war zone and makes you think. But anyway, that's a, that was a good story. Um, so anyway, going back to my story. Um, so what, what can we now express in terms of my major goal for um, generating our video sequences? So we understand now that Toolman is a is a nice argumentation model for letter structure video sequences in a rhetorical way. 
Uh, we've looked at the pros and cons of environmental issues and all the different factors that are perceived as being necessary by the audience. Uh, we have the linked open data cloud, uh, which we can then use to attach as concepts to our different video clips and to our uh, things that people are saying. And we've looked at logos, ethos, pathos, and film theory. So now you should understand a bit more about what I mean by uh, the glue that we needed. So what would I like to do next? Um, basically take the all the experience we've gained in the Vox Populi system and look to see whether this semantic graph structure actually gets out of hand because he had the very simple representation for the information and was able to do this uh, complete graph structuring, whereas you have a more complex environment and you have the huge graph, perhaps that just doesn't work anymore. And I'm also interested in looking at other domains where the discourse, the personal discourse is very valuable. So education is one. So you're trying to teach people different things and every person knows slightly different things. So how can you give them the information that they need at that time that can then help them with the other information they need later? And even crime solving is an interesting one. Um, the police get an awful lot of data from video sources and uh, audio sources. And they have all these different pieces of evidence. And what they're doing is they're looking for the story. They're trying to understand the, you know, what happened in a certain scene, and they'll have different hypotheses for what could have happened, and the evidence will fit in a certain way. So you're sort of working this multiple story thread. This is again something that our research is moving in that direction. And my long-term goal is basically to have a, a larger collection of related discourse models. So I showed you the Toulmin model, I showed you these annotations, but what I really want is a framework where these um, story models fit together in that framework. So I didn't do this on my own, obviously. Um, I have all these people to thank. And that's the summary of my story. Thank you very much. So do we have time for some questions? Yes, please. Sure. Um, I was wondering, because you started the presentation with creating a story that's relevant for the user, so if I understood correctly, in Vox Populi, in the end, uh, there is only one version of the story generated. Ah, sorry, right. To the yeah, sorry. So I was throwing out slides last week. <laughs> uh, there is a specific dialog box um, where the user can choose a whole bunch of things. Um, so you can choose... Uh, which question you want to have the system ask. So the questions are asked by real people, but you could select which question is being asked. You could then choose to have either all the videos that agreed with that same question, or sorry, were positive, or all that were negative, or you could have a system called Create Clash. And the Create Clash is what I showed you, because that's the most interesting, where you have one person who has one opinion, you have other people that have a different opinion, and then the system slots the different sequences together to show how the opinion differs between the, the people. Okay. So th there were, sorry, th th there were many different ones. Thank you. Next question. Yes, sorry. Just to bring away the drone in front. Okay. Another question. So in the beginning, you mentioned about we want to create a story which is interesting. Right. So in the beginning, you had mentioned about the story to be interesting. Uh, and not just relevant. So how are you capturing this in your uh, graphs? That is the question. So if you could detail a little on that. Right, okay, so what I was trying to explain is to use the, like the film theory where you have all these um, ways of uh, keeping the viewer ent entertained is the wrong word. Um, but you're, you're showing uh, the same way that a filmmaker would make sure that the film is becoming coherent and consistent. 
and in the Aristotle with its logos pathos ethos. So the ethos is very important. Um, so if you just had state statements with some random background, you'd have a very different association with the film than here you saw the woman and the two guys. And each of these people you will have a different response to in terms of ethos, but also in the pathos. So this is what I'm trying to get across. Am, am I answering your question? Okay, so you're not really selecting content which is interesting, rather putting together ah, in an interesting yeah, I'm really, way. Okay, sorry, right, okay. There was another project we did, and there we did a study on if you show somebody a news item, then how would the information related to that news item be interesting? And there we were looking at that, and we did some studies with real people, and we showed them clips, and if you like, the clip could be described with concepts from the links on the data player. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you can, you can have other concepts that are one or two steps away from those concepts and the links on the data player, and are they interesting, question mark? And then we found that, and we found